sugar can be sweet. So when you taste it, you taste sweet. But if there's a disease, such as jaundice, as is mentioned here, although that sugar candy remains sweet, it's not affected. Still, the one who is tasting that sugar candy tastes it as bitter, or not sweet at all. So that is because of the disease. But it says, what is the cure for the disease is sugar candy. Jaundice is known as a disease of the liver. So by taking this sugar candy regularly, although it may be bitter, gradually it is doing two things. One, it's curing the disease of jaundice, which has many symptoms. One is bitterness in taste. And at the same time, the sweetness of the sugar cane is starting to become more and more apparent in the tasting. And finally, when the disease is complete, the taste is sweet, very sweet. So what is that disease? And that disease is material desires, material association, material uh, tendencies. Still, the condition, when the conditioned soul is engaged in devotional service, the tendency is still look towards material energy and the material association. Because this verse really, in purple, mentions how dangerous it is to that interrupts with the sweetness of our chanting is what we say, asat sangha, that association, that is what we say of the materialistic type. So therefore, these diseases, the attachments to happiness through fruit of activities, the attachment of happiness through uh, various types of material relationships, like that. So all these make the sweetness of the holy name hidden, although it's always sweet. So what is Rupa Goswami saying? There's a formula. And I think he gives it right in the translation itself. When Prabhupada expands it in the in the purport, and where he says that hmm, simply by carefully chanting these sweet names every day, a natural relish awakens within his tongue, and his disease is gradually destroyed. Not just destroyed, but the root cause of the disease is also removed. If you just deal with the symptoms of the disease, then again, the disease may return. But the root cause, when that is uprooted, is like when you pull, uh, if you're cutting grass and you pull weeds, but if you leave the root of the weed into the, the soil, it will grow back again. But if you take the root out, the weed is destroyed. So. In the same way, by carefully and seriously going deep into the chanting of the Holy Name with attention and with as much, as much devotion as one can access in that chanting, gradually, and this is the point that Rupa Goswami wants to make, and the Acharyas emphasize this, it's a gradual process. But the problem is, we have a tendency to, to be like Hasti Snan. You know what Hasti Snan is? Snan means bath and Hasti means elephant. Prabhupada gives that example of the elephant, a really big animal, but it likes to run into the, into the river and takes his big trunk and very, very enthusiastically splashes water all over himself. He becomes clean of all the dust. He gets out onto the land and does the same thing when he gets back onto the land. He takes dust from the land and throws it all over. So what is the benefit of elephant bath? It says it's practically useless. So in approaching the process of devotional service, the principle of remaining fixed in the activities makes the, what we say, the characteristics of transcendental qualities, devotion, and the sweetness that is there innately in the process of devotional service, what we say manifesting. It can be as fast 
very slow. Someone used to say, Prabhupada, how long does it take to become a pure devotee? Prabhupada said, you can do it in one moment, or you can take you millions of life. He was giving an example of the fo how important it is to focus. Um, and then Rupa Goswami emphasizes that in the process of chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So that's why we have these festivals. It's not it's an opportunity to go deep into the hearing and chanting of the holy name and absorb ourselves, develop that taste, carry that taste with us, and continue to practice regular chanting of the holy names of the Lord. But if we don't avoid those things that take away from the from our devotional happiness, such as wrong association, are still looking towards material life for some satisfaction and some fulfillment, then it is like the elephant, simply bathing and getting dirty again. So we have to, we might say, of course many of you are, associating with worldly-minded people, but you don't have to associate with worldly-minded people because the principle of association is to develop affection for asad, or people who are, what we say, interested in material enjoyment. Association doesn't mean physical proximity. Prabhupada gives the example. Even now, when we're associating with devotees, we could not be associating with devotees if our consciousness is somewhere else. So Prabhupada gives the example of flea will be on, uh, sitting on the king. But what does the flea and the king have to do with each other? Practically there's no relationship. There's no relationship. So in the same way, physical, physical proximity is an indication, but it's not the understanding of what is association. It's to develop effect. So therefore, by developing affection for and friendship with devotees, that fulfills that need which we all have to have that relationship. Then we won't look towards material arrangements, material association for that fulfillment or that need. And then one can focus nicely, and Prabhupada says, Rupa Goswami says, carefully chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It's amazing when you read about the glorifications of the Holy Name. I mean, the Charyas and Shiva Prabhupada mentions one name, not the whole mantra, just one name of Krishna chanted purely can destroy unlimited amounts of material, what we say, karmic reactions from millions of births. That's how powerful the Holy Name is. What to speak of, that's its, you know, what to speak about the sweetness that comes with that process. So this is Krishna's name, it's so powerful. When we want that taste, but chanchala himana krishna pamati balabhadriha the mind is always not satisfied, right? It only wants to be somewhere else where it's not. <laughs> if you're here, you want to be somewhere else. If you're not here, you want to be here, right? It's like, it's just the way the mind is just restless, always going. So therefore, there is an effort that has to be made. I was in this last kirtan with Ojashri uh, chanting. I was doing everything I could to hear every syllable and I was just thinking I'm going to put it in it. I'm not going to listen I'm not going to look around I'm not going to think of anything I'm just going to listen with all my might and you know the mind says okay let's fight <laughs> so he wants to fight so then my then is a battle but if you're determined and you get the mercy of Krishna coming by your determination, it's because your determination accesses Krishna's mercy. And then you find all of a sudden you're absorbed in the Holy Name and then it's not a matter of a fight anymore, it's just flows. We have that experience. So we want to taste the Krishna's Holy Name. 
And therefore, through the process of focus on the holy names of God, and prayer, prayer is important, prayer is very, prayer indicates our position. That even by our strong efforts to access the mercy of the holy name, it always falls short. But praying to our spiritual master, to Srila Prabhupada, to Lord Chaitanya, to Srila Haridas Thakur, to Sri Krishna himself for his mercy, then that mercy makes our efforts successful. So this is Rupa Goswami's formula for overcoming what is called ignorance or avidya, which is the association of the material energy and the effects of that association. Thank you very much. And now, His Holiness Prahlad Mahar Nanda Maharaj will uh, continue with this particular spiritual senses. But right now the spiritual senses are covered and therefore we're trying to enjoy through a covering. Just like when we serve the feast here, if everyone decided to put a glove over their tongue, the feast wouldn't be so tasty. Similarly, the material energy covering the senses of the soul <coughs> means that we don't really experience things as they actually are. We experience things as they are presented to us through the three modes of material nature. If we want, we can overcome that material nature through the acceptance of transcendental knowledge. As we're receiving knowledge in the material world, from those under the spell of the three modes. We can also receive knowledge from those who are, are in the spiritual energy. And if we accept the knowledge coming from the spiritual energy, then if we follow that, then Krishna will put us into the spiritual energy. Therefore, we have to see what's called sabanda, what is a, basically who we actually are. What is our identity? If we believe we're a Krishna Das or Dasi, then we have to arrange, as Prabhupada writes, we have to arrange our lives in such a way that throughout the 24 hours a day, we're going to help but think about Krishna. And thinking about Krishna means also to see everyone and everything in relation to Krishna. Sri Prabhupada established temples. So what was the idea of having temples so that some poor Hare Krishnas have a place to eat and sleep? No, they probably established temples to act as, first of all, as examples of how devotees should live their lives so that they can remain absorbed in service to Krishna, and therefore a consciousness of Krishna. And that means that Shubhra didn't expect everyone to live in a temple, 
but he expected everyone to make their house into a temple. And that's a question of consciousness. Actually, the soul has a tendency to serve. Service means love, and whatever we're loving, whatever we want to enjoy, whatever taste we want to get, we render some kind of service. For instance, we may love our football team, and what we don't, we can't render so much service, we can't bring them water at halftime. But we just shout at the top of our lungs, praising them, trying to encourage them. So we show our love in that particular way. Simply, if we want to love others in this material world, we render service to them. We make money, or we clean the house, we wash the dishes, we cook. We render some service, this way we show love. If we want to show love to Krishna in our daily activities, if we actually want to properly love others, because after all, people render so much service, and yet still, people are not satisfied. I may serve my family throughout my whole life, and at the end of the life, they're still complaining. As a matter of fact, according to the Bhagavatam, when you get older, and you can't render the same amount of service anymore, they not only complain, but it's almost like they want to put you out of pasture, along with the old gray mare, who ain't what she used to be. So how to render service in such a way is it's actually on a different platform, on a real platform. So that service means we have to have a vision of who we're actually serving. Are we just serving people's material bodies? Or is there something deeper? Is there actually a soul within everyone's heart? And we should be directing our service primarily, not only, but primarily to the soul within the body. So that means I don't really have a wife in one sense, although we don't neglect the time, place, and circumstances. But to think that this is my wife is more or less to think that someone who's riding in a Cadillac or in a Volkswagen is a Cadillac or a Volkswagen. That we forget about the passenger and the drivers. So certainly, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us the formula, Yari Deka Tarikaha Krishna Upadesh Amar Agai Guruhana Tarikadesh. Whoever we meet, that we should think, how can I help them become Krishna conscious? So this does not mean that a few book distributors, that they go out and they're trying to sell books to people, the idea that perhaps this will help them become Krishna conscious, and the rest of us were something other. And that that's not really our duty. Our duty is to, we have some other duty. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu never told a few book distributors to try to help others become Krishna conscious. He wanted everyone at every moment to try to help people become Krishna conscious. As I mentioned this morning, that's all that goes on in the spiritual world. No one has any other business. There's not a few gopis distributing books in the spiritual world, and everyone else is making nice prasadam so they can have a big feast. Although they do make a nice prasadam for Krishna, so that everyone can enjoy a nice feast. Now, whoever we meet, our first business is to have some kind of spiritual vision. The problem is that our business is twofold. One is we want to spread the holy name. But at the same time, we want to create the atmosphere by which the Holy Name will be received properly. So that means everyone has that opportunity, wherever we are, to try to create an atmosphere where the Holy Name will be nicely received. Whether we're living in the temple, whether we're li living our, by ourselves, with others, or even our, in our homes, we can try to create the atmosphere by which the Holy Name is well received by all the members. Probably gave the example, well, in, in the Bhagavad Gita, it's actually not very complicated. Of course, mind makes everything complicated, that's for business. 
but it's actually quite simple. That one she installs the deities and morning, evening, chant Hare Krishna, hear Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, and offer prasad to the deity. That will help one develop the vision that this is my wife, this is my husband, but actually they're eternal servants of Krishna and Krishna has made this arrangement so I can help my wife, I can help my husband, I can help the children advance in Krishna consciousness. In this way, I have an opportunity to actually show my love for them. In the material world, people think if I show my lust, that, that's love. But actually, that's not love, that's lust. It may have a little sweetness at first, but the sweetness that comes from material enjoyment, from bodily satisfaction alone, does not last any long, very long. The example is given that in India, the cows, they love to eat sugar cane. And if you go to India, that there's so many people who make sugar juice there, cane juice, and they have this press and they press it, and after they press the sugar cane, they throw it out onto the ground. So the cows, the cows are everywhere in India and they walk around looking for something to eat. So they find the pressed sugar cane and they pick it up and they start chewing it. <laughs> chewing, chewing, chewing. And there may be a drop of sugar in there, but after they use up the drop of sugar, they spit it out. So another cow comes along and thinks, oh, here's a feast, and picks it up, the same chewed sugar candy, sugar cane, starts chewing, chewing, nothing there. Spits it out. So all day long, one cow after another is getting the remnants of the other cows, <laughs> trying to squeeze a little bit of sugar out of the cane, which is as dry as it can be. But still, they're trying to squeeze some sweetness out of the sugar cane. Similarly, we can chew each other for some time, and after all, there's nothing left. <laughs> And in the material world, we just spit each other out. <laughs> you don't love me. <laughs> and then we go try to find someone else picks us up. <laughs> no sugar. <laughs> Spits us out. <laughs> in this way, children are produced and divorces go on and children can't remember which part of the disciples succession the family they belong to. <laughs> And life goes on in Kali Yuga looking for some sweetness. But actually, the sweetness is there in devotional service. If we actually love others and we try to help them become Krishna conscious, then we'll experience the sweetness that comes from devotional service. That opportunity is there everywhere. And especially we have to take advantage of it and in, in household life or in, the, or in the temple. Now the temple is supposed to show the example of devotees just feeling that sweetness by so much absorption in Krishna consciousness. Everything is there, the deities are there, the same thing in our, that could be there in the household life. The chanting is there, the prasadam is there, the hearing about Krishna is there. It's not really different. And at the same time, the devotees are supposed to be fixed in service. That I'm here not because I didn't want to get a job, I didn't want to support a wife, children are a botheration, you know, just to get my clothes pressed and some prashadam, I didn't want to work so hard. So I came to the temple, chant a few rounds, show up at Mangalarti, and then I get my food and and I may have to wash my own clothes, but what the heck. No, the idea is that the mood, whoever we meet, we try to help them become Krishna conscious. So those living in the temple show that mood that I'm your servant, Prabhupada used to say when we first joined, that we're all called Prabhu. Prabhupada said, it doesn't mean that you're the master. 
now that I joined the temple. And finally I got to a place where everyone's calling me master. That's why I like the temple. I call other people master just to make them feel good, but I don't really believe that. I hope they don't believe it either. <laughs> oh, you think you're master, bro, when you're puffed up. <laughs> you don't know who your master is. The humble people like me. <laughs> no, that mood of that you're my master, I'm here to serve you, and then when we actually have that sweetness, then we can extend it, we become enthusiastic to extend it to others. <laughs> that I'm here in the street, or at your door to door, and I'm here to, to serve you, to help you revive your relationship to Krishna, because that's what my spiritual master in the super succession has told me as my service to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we have that mood, and we practice that mood amongst ourselves, and we experience that sweetness, then it'll even be sweeter when people are not familiar with Krishna, the innocent people, when we actually try to extend that service to them too. The Chaitanya Mahaprabhu must empower us even more to give that sweetness to others. Amongst ourselves, sometimes we take each other for granted and we're not so anxious to give that sweetness to others. We're not so much relying upon Krishna because we think, well, I don't really have to try so hard dealing with my husband or wife, dealing with my children or my friends because Familiarity breeds contempt. But we have to try. And if we make that effort and get some sweetness, then when we go out and meet unfamiliar people, who can we can convince by our effulgence very easily. We can't convince by our high class dress or my haircut. We have to convince them by our enthusiasm, by our confidence, by our appreciation of them, by our friendly attitude, by so many qualities which will be Krishna will empower us with, if that's what we want, to help others become Krishna conscious. Of course, we may go out there and we actually start imagining that I am the enthusiasm, I am the confidence, I am so many great qualities, I am so great that why don't they realize that? Why don't the other devotees realize how great I am? That's the problem in the Hare Krishna movement. So we have to avoid also becoming puffed up with our enthusiasm, puffed up with our advancement in Krishna consciousness. We have to understand that these are all gifts that are available to us through our disciples' succession, that are just waiting for anyone who would like to take up the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu by serving the instructions of Srila Rupa Goswami, performing our sadhana, personal sadhana, and try to extend that to our family members, to our friends, and to the innocent people, and at the same time, try to cut down on Facebook. <laughs> Fast from Facebook at least once a week. Maybe on every ecodicy, if you can't do it once a week. In other words, try to avoid just mindless association. That there's so much mindless association out there. When you hear the news, I guess the, the only thing you can learn, as they say, from history, is that people don't learn from history. So things like the news, it's just mindless. It's all people who are telling us what's going on in the world. They have no idea what's going on in the world because they have no idea that who they are. Not only they don't know that they're a Christian servant, but they're actually identifying themselves with some gross or subtle body. And therefore all the information about conspiracies and wars and this and that, it's all coming from people who are bewildered by the illusory energy. They have no solution. Resolution, revolution, dissolution, no solution. 
Then we're hearing from such persons, not that we don't read the headlines, it's good to read the headlines sometimes. I remember one time I went to Bolivia and I arrived at the airport. It was my first time in Bolivia. And I, as devotees, especially in South America, I didn't read the newspaper. But I should have read, read the newspaper because there was a war going on in Bolivia when I arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Which was rather uncomfortable, especially I was wondering why there's no one at the airport except for me and a few other people. <laughs> and why are all these strange noises going on all around us? You know? It sounded like gunfire. And I was wondering why is no one leaving the airport? <laughs> Anyhow, I found out one devotee picked me up and we had a, it took a long time to get to the temple because we had to go through all these streets and finally we arrived at the temple and that, the war went on for a little while. A few people got killed here and there. But I realized it was probably a good idea at least to check, make sure there's no war going on in the place you're going to. So a little bit of understanding what's going on in modern society is alright, but to get too much absorbed in this conspiracy, that exploitation, this problem. Uh, we have the, solu we are, have the solution to the problems, our own solution, first of all, to try to worry, what is the sense of worrying about what's going on, not only in the mundane world, but even in the ISKCON world? What are we gonna do about it? Pray to Krishna, Krishna, Please, you know, take this temple out of debt in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Your prayer might get answered, but probably it won't have much effect. But in our everyday life, in our every person that we meet, everything that we, every duty that we have personally, if we fulfill that, then we'll become empowered to be able to expand our, not only our, realm of, of a concern, but actually a, a level of influence too. So rather than worrying about the whole world, that if I don't read the newspapers, I don't want to find out what's going on, then the world will just fall apart. Actually, we read the newspapers enough, we hear the gospel enough, not only about the world, but even in ISKCON, our world will probably fall apart after a while our spiritual world. So to neglect this, upeksha, not to become overly concerned, but to be concerned with what we're actually able to influence just to tell someone about Krishna. If we take that attitude that there is a super soul and it's not me. That position is already taken up. I'm not going to fulfill it. Doesn't matter how many rounds I chant. I'm not going to become the super soul in everyone's heart and correct everyone's problems. <coughs> Therefore, leave it up to the super soul. He's pretty good at it. He tries the best he can, at least. And I don't think we'll do any better. So, peace of mind that I don't, my duty is not to save every living entity immediately. My duty is to save myself. And by doing that, I can become a better instrument for Krishna. And the better instrument I become for Krishna, then the more he can utilize me to help others become Krishna conscious. That will take a tremendous burden away from us. Our only duty is to do what Krishna wants us to do, what our spiritual authorities want us to do. And if we're willing to do that, then we'll be able to chant peacefully, happily, attentively, feelingly, and we'll become Krishna conscious. And we'll be able to offer that formula to others who's ever willing and able and receptive to whatever realizations we have. Then individually, because it's not going to be some savior coming to ISKCON. It's like a practice. The whole ISKCON was always after Prabhupada, because Prabhupada was such a central figure, so powerful spiritually, that after his disappearance, then the whole idea was, who's going to be the saviors to come 
and take Prabhupada's position. So Prabhupada didn't really expect like that, nor did he organize his society for so many years so that eventually one savior would come and everyone would be saved by them. No, he wanted each one of us to be the saviors. First of all, to do something to save ourselves and then become a proper instrument to help others, to save others. So each one of us have that responsibility, not only to the world outside of us, but even in our own family lives. We have a responsibility to our children to try to help them become Krishna conscious, even our pets, if we have any of them. Every living entity we come in contact with, then will Krishna will give us a taste. He'll give us a taste for devotional service. He'll give us a taste for him ultimately and for his dear devotees. If we're willing to become an instrument like that. Because in the spiritual world, that's our duty. And we make this existence, which is just an opportunity to us, uh, we make that into a Krishna conscious pastime, then the same opportunity that's there in the spiritual world, moment to moment, can be here in this world also. But we just have to understand things properly and accept them. So, let's talk, stop there. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Maharaj, you were mentioning about uh, taking care of people and helping them to become Krishna conscious and serving them by preaching Krishna consciousness to them. But is it also a service to them if we help them, if they have some need, like uh, either they're emotionally distressed, like especially close people to us, relatives, or we need to do some service to devote to massage him or something like that. And we are thinking that we, by doing that service, we will help him to serve better Krishna and to help him to come closer to that earth. Yeah, everything depends upon our... Did everyone hear the question? No, no, no. Should I repeat it? I can repeat it somewhat. He was... Pramamurti was asked, or was asking, if we have... We're giving people some service, like massaging them or helping them with their emotional problems, if the idea is to help them become Krishna conscious, is that valid? Yeah, of course, that's what makes it valid. If it's actually going to help them become Krishna conscious, make some progress. Prabhupada showed that. They said, Prabhupada, we want to build a house for you. Maybe, I forget where it was, in Mayapur. And Prabhupada said, I'm not interested. And then they rephrased it and said, we want to build a house to glorify the previous Acharyas. And Prabhupada said, oh, that's all right then. So it's, the, it's not just what we're doing, it's the consciousness in which we're doing it. The consciousness is not something small. That is what we're trying to achieve, is Krishna consciousness. Therefore, before we do something, we should know why we're doing it. And we should know what makes it authorized, so that when we do it, it actually becomes an act of devotion. That's why we have acharyas like Srila Prabhupada, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. We have the Srimad Bhagavatam, but we understand that Srila Prabhupada more or less embodied in his, his life, his activities, the teachings of the Bhagavatam, of the previous acharyas. So we have a perfect example of how to work in this material world on every level so that we can help people. Prabhupada distributed prasadam. He distributed, he helped people. Of course, he didn't psychoanalyze them. But he more or less, if we look at Prabhupada's life, how expert he was in dealing with everyone. How somehow or another he knew exactly how to win people's hearts to Krishna. Of course, he didn't try to do the impossible. He offered what he could. I mean, when one person was arguing with more or less pleading with Prabhupada, you know, please help me, please help me. And Prabhupada said, well, chant Hare Krishna. And very Prabhupada said, very feeling. And he said, I have nothing else to offer you. In other words, we have the medicine. People don't want to take it. What can you do? But Prabhupada knew what he was capable of doing to help people. 
and he did everything he could to help them in every respect. So we have to see Prabhupada's life, the life of the Acharyas, the life of the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and see how to help people become Krishna conscious. That may entail many things. Murray Gupta was a physician, but his life was absorbed in Krishna consciousness. So when he saw the peacock fan, when he was administering to the, to the king, the Muslim king, when he saw the Buddha, the peacock fan, he remembered Krishna and he fell in unconscious from the dais. So the king got off the dais and said, what's the matter? He said, well, I have some disease, epilepsy. So sometimes it happens to me. But the king realized that, no, this person is completely absorbed in ecstasy, in love of God. So sometimes we may even do some things like different occupations, but we shouldn't forget Krishna or what we're trying to achieve. So that takes a lot of expertise, a lot of serious consideration. All right, I think it's time for RT. We're definitely going to have. Yeah, RT is next. Okay. Thank you very much, Kantaraj. Thank you for the instruction. Kida. Shilaprabhupada. Kida.